You may be familiar with the infinite sum of the positive powers of one half, one half plus a quarter plus an eighth and so on. This infinite sum equals one, and you might have seen this visual proof that takes a right isosceles triangle of area one and decomposes it into areas consisting of the powers of one half. In the limiting diagram, each of the positive powers of one half will appear, and therefore the infinite sum, which is the limit, must be equal to the full area of the triangle, which is one. Now what if we make a small change and multiply each power of one half by the n minus first Fibonacci number? Then we're looking at the infinite sum n equals one to infinity of f sub n minus one divided by two to the n, which starts zero over two, plus one over four, plus one over eighth, and so on. Can we find the value of this infinite sum? It turns out there are lots of techniques to do this, but one of them involves using a very simple board game. Let's check that proof out. The board in our board game will be a linear array of four squares as pictured here. The first square counts as the starting square and the last square is the ending square. The second to last square tells us that we must go back two spaces. In each round we flip a fair coin. We will advance two spaces if we flip a heads. On the other hand, if we flip a tails, we'll advance one space. We win the game once we land on the end square. Suppose that we want to compute the probability that you will eventually win this game. One way to compute the probability is to break it into cases where we figure out how many ways there are to win in exactly n moves for each n. Notice that if we only have one move, a tails won't get us to the end, and a heads gets us to the go back to square space, which also doesn't get us to the end. So we cannot win in one move, so the number of ways to win in one move is zero. What about if we try to win in exactly two moves? Notice that flipping two tails gets us back to the starting position. If we instead flip tails and then heads, we actually land on the ending position, so we win. If instead we flip heads then tails, we first go to the go back two spaces square, and then we move one square ahead, and we do not win. Similarly, if we flip two heads, we just bounce back and forth between the start square and the go back two spaces square, and we don't land on the ending square. Therefore, there's exactly one way to win in exactly two moves. This doesn't seem like enough information, so let's try to figure out how many ways there are to win in exactly three moves. Notice that tails, tails, tails does not win. Tails, tails, heads also does not win, as it takes us to the start space and then back to the start space again. An interesting case is when we have tails, heads, tails. We do actually land on the ending square, but we got there in two moves, so even though we win, it actually was a win in exactly two moves and not exactly three moves. Likewise, if we do heads, tails, tails, we lose. And if we consider tails, heads, heads, we again land on the ending square, but really we landed there after two moves and not in exactly three moves. The flipping sequence heads, tails, heads actually does land us on the ending square in exactly three moves, so we consider that a win in exactly three moves. Heads, heads, tails won't land us on the ending square at all, so that's a losing game after three moves. And finally, heads, heads, heads again just bounces us back and forth between the start square and the go back two squares square, and therefore we don't land on the ending square. So of the total length three sequences, we win one time in exactly three moves. This doesn't seem like enough data, so let's run one more example where we figure out the number of ways to win in exactly four moves. As we run through the 16 different sequences of length four, we see that a few of them will win, but they will win in fewer than four moves, while a few others will win in exactly four moves. As shown here, the ones highlighted in a deep red are losers, the ones highlighted in a light red are winners but don't win in exactly four moves, and the ones highlighted in yellow are actually winners in exactly four moves. As we work through all 16 examples, we see that there are only two ways to win in exactly four moves. Instead of running more examples, let's think about how we could figure out how many ways there will be to win in exactly five moves. In general, we can actually think about how many ways there are to win in exactly n moves. We might first start with an h, and then we just have to worry about winning an n minus one move since we're back at the start position. Or we might flip two t's and end up back at the start position, 
and therefore we'd wonder how many ways we can win in n-2 moves after flipping two t's. Notice that if we flip th, we'll land on the ending space, and therefore we will have won before we actually got to n moves, provided that n is larger than 2. This reasoning tells us that if we want to know how many ways there are to win in exactly 5 moves, we simply add the number of ways to win in 3 moves and 4 moves to get 1 plus 2, which is 3. This means that if f sub n is the number of ways to win in exactly n moves, then f1 equals 0, f2 equals 1, and fn equals fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2 for n greater than 2. We can then use this recurrence to map out the number of ways to win in exactly n moves for any n we want, and we get the sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and so on. This sequence of numbers is basically the Fibonacci sequence, since it satisfies the exact same recurrence as the Fibonacci sequence. The only difference is that the index is shifted by 1. But now we almost have our answer. The probability of any string of length n appearing is 1 over 2 to the n. So the probability of a string of length 1 is 1 over 2 to the 1, of length 2 is 1 over 2 squared, of length 3 is 1 over 2 cubed, and so on. But now we can use this information to find the probability of winning in exactly n moves by multiplying the number of ways of winning in n moves by the probability of each such string. As we're interested in the probability of eventually winning the game, we can actually add up the disjoint cases of the probabilities of winning in exactly n moves for each positive integer n. Therefore, the probability of eventually winning this game is given by 0 over 2 to the 1 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 2 cubed, and so on, where each term in the sum is the n minus first Fibonacci number divided by the nth power of 2 as n ranges over all positive integers. But now here's the trick. The probability of winning is 1, because you must eventually win the game if you play forever. Therefore, the infinite sum that we were interested in, which is the sum where n ranges from 1 to infinity of the n minus first Fibonacci number divided by the nth power of 2, must be 1. It's amazing that this infinite sum is exactly the same as the infinite sum of the powers of 1 half. And it's more amazing that we were able to prove this using a simple board game. This makes me wonder if there are other infinite series that you can evaluate the sum of by using a board game. For example, what if we imagine the sequence a sub n, which is defined recursively as a sub n equals a sub n minus 1, plus 2 times a sub n minus 2, plus a sub n minus 3, where a1 is 0, a2 is 3, and a3 is 5. Can you evaluate the infinite sum where n ranges from 1 to infinity of a sub n divided by 3 to the n? using a board game argument? Here's a hint. Can you use this six spot board game to find the sum of the infinite series? This video was inspired by a 1994 Mathematics Magazine article by Kay Litchfield. Check the description for a link to that article, and also you can find a link to the 2022 February issue of Math Horizons, which contains a solution to the final problem posed.